What's up, Spell Slingers? My name is Gary and John Wells. And I'm Drew Flitton. And I'm Corey Janabagian. And this is Untap a Peep Drink. Beer up. What's up, guys? We're back at it again with the Color Wheel series. This is number two. We're going Woober order, so we're going to start off today with blue. We did white we're last also week. We'll finish with blue. We'll finish with blue. <laughs> we'll finish with beers, is what we'll do. I'm going to start with beers. <laughs> okay, little, then let's start with beers. A little blue in the middle, then more beers. <laughs> well, as Corey said, we're going to start with beers. Corey, you're up first. Okay, today I'm drinking a really interesting sounding beer. It's uh, the Ripper. From Stone Brewery, and it's a San Diego Pale Ale. So I think they're just making shit up now. Yeah, I mean, they're just like, <laughs> eh, fuck it, let's do what we want. Where, but, are we, where, where are we from? San Diego. Perfect. That's what it Slap is. Slap it on the label. The description on the back's kind of long, but I think it's worth, worth reading. We stay true to our San Diego roots by pushing the hot boundaries of this style. While some might think it lingers on an edge far closer to an IPA with all the dry hot flavor and aroma, it's actually right in line with the current day interpretation of a West Coast Palo. Ours just so happens to have an Aussie accent that's cascading with a juicy amount of grapefruit and passion fruit hoppiness. So veg out or venture out. Either way, rip one open and taste this awesome golden nectar. So the idea with this beer is that it's kind of a fusion between India Pale Ales and Australian Pale Ales, right? Yeah. Something along those lines. Or maybe it's like a, a Cascade Pale Ale. It's just a, just like a weird fusion. Just What's the take. IBUs on that? I don't think it says the IBUs, but it's 5.7%. A ripping swell of juicy hops. But yeah, so it's got like the Australian Galaxy hops and then it has the Cascade hops, which is a Northwest hop. So it's like one of the few things I actually know about hops is like those two. <laughs> so like I'm glad that they chose them. So I'm probably going to enjoy it more than a normal kind of pale ale. Personally, I've got the Park City Brewery American Pale Ale. Uh, it is just a clean, supposedly nice, crisp pale ale. Don't really know too much about it. Doesn't have a nice story to go along yeah. with it. It just they has the label. Need a story. It's a red, white, and blue can with a goddamn eagle on the front. <laughs> that is American as it gets. I mean, you're not fucking lying there. (laughs) And Gary, what about you? All right, today I'm drinking Boulevard Brewing Company's Tank 7 American Saison Ale. Uh, Like we said before, it's 8.5% alcohol and 38 IBUs. Uh, Shit, just smelling it. I can smell quite a bit of hoppiness in here. We're all going to have some bitterness today. Oh, that's a pretty beer. That though. is a God beautiful. Damn, that really does. Golden. So this American Saison got a nice head, nice clear white, not clear, white head. Uh, pretty golden in there. Uneven bubbles. It's not like it's super symmetrical all the way around. Hmm. Interesting. For Saison, I thought it would be a little more fruity. But it almost has Ooh. like the taste of what white bread smells like, kind of, with a little bit of hop notes. It's definitely got that hoppy. It's got this kind of zing to it, like this tanginess yeah. to it. Certainly better than an Ooh, IPA yeah. to me. That's really drinkable. Yeah, that's yeah. That is a, a lovely summer beer. Which ideally is what this American ale is supposed to be. This is like one of the most American fucking cans you've ever fucking seen. Like it's missing stars that, and stripes. It's blue. Pouring that right over your computer freaks me <laughs> out. I was like, oh, God. It's kind of a, a goldenish color. Slightly nice more. Nice head to it. A little more red than the Tank 7. <laughs> oh, what the Drew fuck did it. I just smell? A we had video. Face. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> this, that smell is so weird. Let me smell it. Smell. it smells like... Like if you took rotting fruit and like tried to roast <laughs> it. an even worse phase. <laughs> you know what it smells like? And it's going to be terrible for <laughs> Park City Brewery. It kind of smells like sweaty feet. You know what it I mean? It smells like sweaty socks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does it taste like sweaty socks? I don't like it. <laughs> is is, there, wow. a, is yeah, there a standard you guys, that's for what it is. American pale ale? It, it smells to... buttery. Yeah. yeah. And I fucking hate butter. That's weird. That's the taste too. That's why I don't like it. Fuck that shit. It's butter. It is buttery. Okay, so really? bitterness on the end. Let me Whoa. get there. So yeah. it really is quite American. <laughs> yeah. So okay, they they describe it as the aroma as a moderate citrus, piney, and earthy malty notes. So I would say 
somewhat citrusy bullshit the rest of it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I I'm mean, not like, unless you're talking like earthy, as in like you walk through the fucking earth, and this is what's on your socks now. And the taste: moderate caramel sweetness, citrus hints, citrus with hints of grapefruit, piney notes. I'm gonna be honest; I didn't get any of that. Uh, the unless the all of those bitterness. combine to form the nice. taste of butter. <laughs> yeah. So the if bitterness you, on the end is. If you try and the delineate <laughs> the difference between the butter smell and the beer smell, it. I don't think it smells like feet anymore. I think it's a combination of those two. But yeah, it smells buttery, tastes like butter with hops. Yeah, that is. <laughs> it's kind of a weird non-taste. I fucking hate this beer. That yes. might be the everything weirdest, about this beer. Weirdest is- beer we've had on so far without trying to be a weird beer. Yeah, it's, it's like this should just be a fucking beer. like hoppy <laughs> hoppy ale instead. Yeah. Like I don't like this Maybe beer. Maybe this at is all. a weird like, like a okay, weird so batch or something. To be like frank, I don't like butter taste of butter anything to do with it i love it so see i this I like is a beer in... that fucking turns me off like no other <laughs> might have to switch drew on this one i fucking hate that yeah i'm diving into the ripper put that thing away that is so weird i don't want to smell it taste it deal with it but like god damn that is like <laughs> such a like hey you know that's that's a, a thing you sometimes you just gotta admit when something's not good it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a good beer it's just you don't it's not my you don't my, like not, it yeah, this like is it. a beautiful looking beer too yeah, a nice bright orange Somewhere in between the two of these others, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Like, the American is more of a reddish, kind of an Auburn. I poured the Tank 7 before Drew poured the Park City uh, APA, and my head is still a little bit Yeah, you've bit got a there. residual head. Yeah. On there. It smells like an IPA. Little, I expect a, it to be very little, similar to an IPA. A maybe weirder. a little more smooth and a little more... Buttery? <laughs> I fucking hope not. <laughs> Can we not? <laughs> this is actually really good. <laughs> You get a lot of flavors from an IPA, but like you're saying, it's really, really smooth yeah. and it's not bitter. There's a little bitterness on the end, but not kicking the There's definitely some bitterness the punch. to the, to the okay. aroma to it, the nose on it. Is yeah. It, it's definitely bitter. Yeah. Kind of piney it, and citrusy on the nose. It, ta- it smells a lot more like an IPA than it tastes. It's a very easy drinking IPA. Oh, wow. That's smooth as fuck. Yeah. That's like so good. It's all flavor. No punch. No punch from the hops. Yeah, there's kind of like, as the flavor ends, just like the aftertaste is a little bit bitterness. Yeah. But like, God, that's that's a very smooth finish to it. Like that is, that's a good beer. Yeah. Why did I get the fucking short? I'll change you. <laughs> yeah, that really is. That's a, that's you a very taste, You taste beer. hops, but you yeah. don't feel you, the it hops. It tastes like, like an you, APA, you, IPA. You smell it more than like, and I think that the glass we have here is very like conducive to like bringing that all together. But that, that's, I think that's probably the best beer. I mean, Gary probably doesn't like it as much as because yeah, the hops like are there. Tastes <laughs> like, like an IPA, drinks Did you guys like get a half. This? Did I toss this around? I don't think we tried that one yet. It does have, a, like, comparing those last two, Gary's is a bit more funky. Like, there is that Saison quality to it. Yeah, I'm getting that. There's, there is some fruit. There is a lot of fruit, but not <laughs> yeah. as fruity. Drew's just hiding <laughs> the Park City one. <laughs> that beer. beer is not a good beer to me. Okay, now that we all have our beers settled, we've rearranged picked, them. A yeah, little we've bit. rearranged them. I have the butter beer. Okay, butter beer would be. It sounds <laughs> butter so beer much more is way better than yeah. this beer because it's like butterscotch instead yeah. of actual butter. <laughs> like the texture's probably a bit off, but okay, I digress. <laughs> Corey, but, let's get back to the main topic here. So we're talking about blue today, and we've divided it into four different topics. So those topics are. How blue strives for idealistic perfection. Perfection needs protecting. I like the alliteration. Sorry, that's my bad. <laughs> the never-ending search for knowledge, and the fact that knowledge is power. Yeah, I think what we'll find is there's a lot of uh, scientists and educated folk yeah, that show up in lots blue of a lot. Reading, like, uh, artificers, and crazy lab inventors, inventors, yeah. And, inventors yeah. and all sorts of interesting folks. So. Before we get into it properly, we're going to read the moral quote for Blue here. Blue seeks perfection through knowledge. And Corey, you kind of touched on those topics a little bit. Walk us through how Blue does this. So the first part, the strive for idealistic perfection, that comes from this idea of tabula rasa or the blank slate. It's this idea that everyone is born into the world as a blank slate, basically, and you have the potential to be whatever you want to do and rise to greatness and become who you're meant to be. Right. And so Blue has this kind of ideal that if you can become greater and better, 
then you should. Yeah. Stri- like you should strive to do it. Yeah. Always strive to be a 10 out of 10 as best you can be. Yeah. And so my kind of favorite story through cards and artwork is the Delver of Secrets into final iteration, which goes from Delver of Secrets, which flips to become Insectile Aberration. Uh, and that was from original Innistrad. And then in Shadows over Innistrad, we got Aberrant Researcher, which flips to become Perfected Form. And then in the very next set in Eldritch Moon, we got the Docent of Perfection, which becomes Final Iteration. And so this just kind of shows how Blue is able to change and improve itself through experimentation and implementation of new ideas and strategies to make this perfect being of its own uh, device. This nasty bug man. Hey man, it's, <laughs> if you fuck with it, you fuck with it. I do not fuck with nasty bug man. <laughs> Even though Docent of Perfection is fucking really good. Yeah, I, I love that card. All right, so Blue also is really able to adapt and innovate. And you see cards like Arcane Adaptation and then Padim, Console of Innovation, which just through their names, you can tell what is going on. That leads us kind of to our, our next like major idea, which is that perfection needs protecting, right? Sometimes knowledge and perfection and having this ultimate ideal leads to trouble. Uh, and so Blue has kind of some offensive and defensive strategies here. And as Grant said, a lot of it is very reactive. And we see that primarily in counter spells, right? Everyone knows Blue has counter spells, yeah. but it has such a diverse way to do it, right? You need to prevent action that doesn't li- align with your plans, right? Counter magic allows us, and it shows us this understanding of magic that allows the user to cancel, negate, or dispel whatever your opponent's doing. So this third point is actually kind of funny. We, we've got written down, countering requires a strong force of will a- to stop your opponents and give them a memory lapse. But truly... When you look at it from a lore perspective, this was around the same time that books like um, The Belgariad, which is actually where my name comes from, written by David Eddings. The, Just brush that off my shoulder real quick. The, yeah. The idea NBD. of magic being literally something that everybody can tap into, but that you have to learn and then create literally like a muscle memory like you have to use your will the the books that i just talked about they they always uh reference the will and the word and so magic does that very well in its lore of you know talking about we can do this because we have the will to be perfect or the will to counter that spell or or however you want to look at it all right sometimes you just really need to stop somebody from doing something right you have this kind of desperation and you've got things like pact of negation foil uh force of will where you're kind of putting yourself at a disadvantage potentially to make sure that your opponent doesn't do their stuff right like pact of negation you can literally lose the game because yeah of it. but it's such a strong effect it's the, the the hail mary kind of play and blue doesn't just counter stuff with normal spells of course it can use creatures we've got glenalendra archmage siren storm tamer and nimble obstructionist or as everyone likes to call it the Stifle Bird. Stifle's a good card. Why not put it on a creature? Yep. And then cycle that creature away to get that effect. I hate that card. It's, it's, it's hurting what so you'll find too, <laughs> yeah, What you'll find too with Blue, uh, and we'll talk about it later, is that they have this ability to flash things out, and so it makes some of these creatures uh, basically a counter spell. I mean, you can... They're able to impart their knowledge of magic onto their minions. So, as Gary was saying, like, this... Flash idea is very strong in blue, and blue actually has a card, Leyline of Anticipation, which grants your all of your stuff flash. Um, and so this card is incredibly important in blue just because it allows you to have all of the normal sorcery effect and creature spells to be reactive spells. So it changes yep. your entire plan to be able to react to whatever your opponent is doing. And I don't think that can be understated. Yeah, yeah. it changes the way your board state operates because you don't have to lay your plan out and give everybody else the knowledge. You watch things happen and choose your moment. Yeah, you're changing and deciding the tempo at which you play all of your spells and react to everything that everybody else is doing. Yeah, and usually Gary is the one to say, and this is really important in Commander because, but like this card is insane in Commander because once you start to be able to operate on the last person before you use end step, it changes the entire way you can play the game. Yeah, yeah. this is why Videlkin Orrery is so good. It's because it's colorless, so you give that ability to every color, not yeah. just blue. Yeah. And Land- it's, it's pseudo putting everybody a turn behind because they're not reacting to what you're doing on their turn. They have to do it the next turn after you've done it. Right, and Leyline, of course, has the, the Leyline ability where if it's in your opening hand, you can start with it on the battlefield, which... I don't know what Wizards are <laughs> I, Yeah, I don't know why like. they made that ability. <laughs> like, I wish, man, that's... So on the other side from reactive, there's the proactive side of blue, which is just basically, it means the best 
defense is the is a good offense. And these include the, your tap down effects like Icefall Regent, Frost Links, tr- Claustrophobia, and they also allow you to sneak in things with spells like Sleep. Sleep is a card that allows you to tap down your opponent's entire board, which just allows you to come in for damage and they can't react to it, which is just something that blue generally doesn't like to go shields down, and so this allows them to do that. Yeah, or just to buy you some time because they don't untap. You get an extra turn. Yeah, instead of doing what black would do and just killing everything or, you know, the arrest kind of thing that white would do within the law, it's just sort of that force of will type thing where you just force them yeah. to be docile control for a turn. Them. Yeah. yeah, and they do have some effects like claustrophobia, which do tap it down and stop them from acting, but... Same time, I think that a permanent for one creature is not necessarily going to be the same value as what tapping an entire board down. Another thing that blue likes to do is a lot of bounce effects. And I think these are the ones, besides counter spells, that when people think of blue, they think of these type of effects. Yeah, so these bounce effects allow you to find more time to find a more permanent yeah. answer, right? Whether that's a counter spell itself or another like enchantment to tap down, uh, it just gives you, it just buys you time to actually find the correct solution. I think it fits thematically with the knowledge thing when you when you put your opponent's hand back or put your opponent's threats back into their hand, you have the ability to know what their plays could be. Um, and yeah, so that's also, something Blue really likes like, to do. Is as far as the game of Magic is concerned, uh, when you bounce something to someone's hand, that sets them back a turn because they have to then redo that turn, basically, uh, which is strong in and of itself. Yeah. And so you see these in cards like Man of War, Unsummon, of course, is like the classic. the classic. Um, I'd say Man of War is a classic itself. Like, yeah. That's such a, a pivotal creature. Like People understand what that creature is supposed to do, how it does it. Like It's just a go-to. <laughs> the big classic one for EDH, Cyclonic Rift. Yeah, the so... Powerhouse. Yeah. Sometimes you can't just like bounce one creature. You need to clear the way to allow your plans to, to be able to act. Uh, so you got to get rid of everything. So we've got like Evacuation, Cyclonic Rift, uh, my personal favorite, Whelming Wave. Yeah, most blue board wipes you'll find are bounce board wipes. With the exception of Ixadron. Yeah. Blue is, is just weird. <laughs> yeah. Blue is not really the, I'm going to kill all your stuff. It's yeah. the, you can have it back, but it's going to cost you. Yeah. It's a different kind of removal. So another way that uh, Blue really likes to do sort of its evasion and counter magic is to avoid the confrontation altogether. If you don't have to fight someone, why would you do it? Yeah. yeah I don't need creatures if I could just get rid of everything that you have. So we have cards like Memi. Or- trying the butterbeer again. Oh, God. I, I can't even like get it close to my face because I just smell it. <laughs> it's it's definitely grown on me, but I don't really think it's good. <laughs> Better? No. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's like uh, next. It tastes like potato chips at this point. It's really weird. It tastes like you oversalted and over buttered just anything. Like it doesn't. It's just. It's still weird. Still buttery. It just hasn't changed to me. <laughs> like honestly. Like I had so much higher expectations from that. So some of the ways that Blue avoids these confrontations is through what uh, is sort of in the community referenced as milling. Uh, we've got cards like Memory Erosion, Increased Confusion, and Mind Sculpt, where you can literally, you don't have to counter their spells. You don't have to defend against them. You get rid of their library before they even have a chance to draw the card. So the reason why we call this milling is because there was the original artifact for milling stuff which was millstone which was i believe two mana and tap it you target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard and so that is where we get mill from is that you are using the millstone effect to uh essentially like sabotage your opponent's plans yeah i like to think of it as sort of metaphorically if you're you the player are the planeswalker and all of the cards in your deck are spells that you know It's the way that the blue color sort of circumvents your knowledge or robs you of your knowledge. They're taking some of the spells that you could have used and not allowing you to even have access to them. Right. Mental attacks are sometimes just going to be better than physical attacks, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think everybody knows about milling, but nobody really thinks about it because if you draw a card and your library doesn't have any cards, then you lose the game. But nobody ever plans on getting to that point. Yeah. It's such a difficult strategy and basically every format that the only time you see it in i think realistically is like in limited formats you know 40 cards it's actually not it's that hard to do uh easier especially if like you have a control deck that you're milling people out or just combo mill which is really what we see in like 
EDH and other formats. Yeah. Like Storm Mill, for example, in Modern. Like, I've played that deck several times, and, like, it's just my excuse to play Storm, but, like, <laughs> hey, I'm milling you out instead yeah. of just, you know, Grape Shot. Yeah. But, but same with Life Gain as a tangential effect. It can actually be, or a supplementary effect, it can actually be really effective because, you know, when someone mills an Emrakul, well, that was a really good thing for me. I didn't have to worry about that shit entering the battlefield. Yeah, it al- allows you to avoid potential threats before they're even a threat like even a potential threat realistically because your opponents have never drawn them it also allows you to see your opponent's strategy and game plan without ever having to have them show it to you yeah you don't even have to interact with it you see where it's where it could be headed speaking of interaction if your opponents can't see or interact with your creatures how can they stop them right so we've got these different mechanics that are very proactive on the blue side right they allow for the tempo strategies to go very far right we've got hexproof Skulk, flying, uh, and unblockable, which is no longer a keyword now. It's just this creature can't be blocked, which changing specific wording is something that we'll see throughout Magic's history as necessary and sometimes questionable because why can't unblockable just be a keyword? I feel like it's kind of explains itself. Instead of the damage-oriented keywords, blue sort of has all of these evasive keywords. Yeah, and I mean, you see cards like Aqueous Form, uh, which just allows you to grant unblockable something. Uh, Miss Cloaked Herald from the recent Ixalan sets. Uh, and then why not put Hexproof on top of that with Invisible Stalker? Right? That's just like a classic good tempo play. Yeah, the blues creatures are usually small, and so you get incremental value over time. And these evasive keywords just let you get in. So another personality trait of blue, if you want to call it that, is the never-ending search for knowledge. And you'll find that in the lore as well as in the actual mechanics that follow blue. Um, Like we said earlier, you're going to find a lot of scientists and researchers and uh, artificers and all these people who you would suspect to be smart guys who are sort of through their will and their knowledge trying to build a better world. Either that or they're fucking nutters. <laughs> or both. It's a very slippery slope. Um, but knowledge allows us to improve personally as well as to increase our effectiveness, right? And so we have to do research, which in magic, research is very kind of... Uh, One-sided? Yeah, well, it's just <laughs> it's very linear in, in its approach, I think, right? Because what you want to do in, in research for magic is you're drawing spells, you're trying to get good card selection, um, you're trying to like plan and like preemptively explain what is going to happen. Um, and to do that, we just have like classic draw spells. Just hard draw. I mean, there's a reason why the next card is restricted in Legacy and banned everywhere else. is because it's just that powerful. So it's Ancestral Recall. Costs one blue for an instant that says target player draws three cards. So that's one blue for an instant. Now the next card is two and a blue for a sorcery. Let's draw two cards, and that's divination. So you see the difference in power level? One is fair, one is not. <laughs> so three mana draw two versus one mana instant speed draw three. Yeah, and they, they sort of brought Ancestral Recall back with Treasure Cruise, only it's an eight drop, but you can delve for seven. Which allows you to exile stuff it, out of your graveyard. It's a, yeah, it's a pseudo Ancestral Recall, but that's how much they had to tone it down to make a balanced card yeah they printed ancestral visions which is a very similar but it has suspend instead and even then people are abusing it so once they kind of went to treasure cruise it was like oh wow this is still a very good card i'm pretty sure it's pointed in canadian highlander like because it's still that good talk about unfair the next card we'll talk about ristic study i think that's a fair card it is fair but it's it's just just ridiculous yeah (laughs) Yeah. uh you know i mean i don't like to be on the other side of it but it's not like i'm salty about it. it's just like yeah okay go ahead and draw yeah, it's it's such a good card because you get so much value off it because no one is ever going to pay one I feel un- like, unless they have extra mana too. But most people are tapping out well, all their and mana. It depends on the deck too because there are certain decks that you just don't want them to have that tempo advantage. Yeah, and also I feel like it depends on the format because in Commander specifically, you look at it and you see that if somebody else hasn't paid their one, it becomes so much more of a tax on you personally to yeah. pay that. Yeah. So it's easier to let them go and just kind of go wild and be like, okay, guys, they're going to draw, you know, three cards extra every turn. We have to team up and, and do something versus just like, I'm going to be the one to make a stand. It's yeah, like, you have to decide we all do as it a or, table. Yeah, we all do it or we, we don't do it. Um, but I think that as far as flavor is concerned, like 
Rustic study. You are chilling in your study. <laughs> yep. You are fucking getting all the knowledge you possibly 100%. can. Because, of course, in real life, you know what the cards in your deck are. But now that you've shuffled it, you don't know what you're coming yeah. up to. Um, so card draw and then this next section, card selection. Blue is really good at also scrying. Right. And so if you can't draw the card, you can at least figure out what's coming up and whether you want it to be that card or reorder your cards and sort of have the knowledge of what the next turn will be. I feel tangential to that is the mass card draw that we see as well. We have just like Stroke of Genius, Brand Guys, or Blue Sun Scene. It's where it's just, I don't care what my next card is. I just want all of the cards yeah. I possibly can. Yeah, X is 10. I'm going to draw 10 cards. Yeah. Uh, but with card selection, blue just wants options, 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 options. Like, let me stack my top. Let me figure out what card I want. Let me figure out of the top four cards, which one is going to be best in the situation. Allow me to make that choice because I know better than, you know, like what my deck's randomness is going to be. Yeah. I think it's probably important to know as a tangent here that blue is one of the colors that has the most options for unlimited hand size. Um, which fits with obviously the card draw that comes with those mechanics, but also with just the idea of the lore that unlimited knowledge is always better. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, those fit hand in hand with your card draw. Yeah. And just top deck manipulation in general is just so powerful. That's why we have spells like brainstorm and ponder, anticipate, impulse, dig through time. And then factor fiction, fiction is a different kind of one because you, you're giving an, an opponent a choice give you cards but you still see all those cards yeah you know what the options are and if you're in commander this is where factor fiction becomes incredibly powerful just because you can work with somebody and say okay these are the cards that i need and sometimes yeah. especially when you are the one digging for answers for the table the yeah. table's gonna favor you a lot of the time and i think i think Corey and i have teamed up multiple times where i'm just oh, like yeah. here i have to make this quote-unquote Fair. So I'm going to give you four and set this other one yep, aside. I'm going to give you this land or all the cards that you need. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just a matter of working with the people that, you know, are at your table to, to find the correct answer. And I think Factor Fiction probably isn't as good in single player or heads up, but it's still like I, I play it still. It's still a very good card. Yeah. If your deck is built well, then you're always going to get value. I was going to say, if it. all your cards are good, then there's still only so much. Yeah. You can even do. if you. Just get two lands. That's two lands that you don't need to draw on your next turns. Yeah, and you forcing your opponent to make cycle. that decision as well tells a lot about what they need that's you to true. do and what they are hoping that you can't do. Yeah. Because if they put you at like, well, you can choose this one good card or four other cards, and it's just like, well, obviously, this is the one card that is going to yeah, hose you. So <laughs> They really don't want me to have this counter spell <laughs> yeah. right now. I wonder why. Yeah. Um, and sometimes this kind of card draw and this impulsive research goes a little too far right and so you kind I was of say, i feel like this card is like the ultimate i need all the knowledge oh card. absolutely and you see that in the art we've got laboratory maniac which well sometimes you go a little too far with what you're doing and you mill yourself out but if you have lab man the, do it the one time no more. you want to right. mill yourself or get milled so another thing that i think fits with the top decking is the planning and preemptive knowledge. Right. So, and that goes again with what Corey was saying with the like top deck manipulation, like opt, preordain, ponder, brainstorm, like all kind of fit in there. And it allows us to like proactively ensure that we're going to get what we want out of our draws. Yep. I mean, it allows us to maximize what we're getting, really. So, Blue is very conscious about what spells it's using and it tries to maximize its uses of those spells, right? And so, in that theme, it's kind of Knowledge begets more knowledge, and oftentimes it's a more efficient way to do so as well. So we've got Jace's Sanctum, Curious Homunculus, which transforms into basically the same idea as what Jace's Sanctum is, which allows you to cast instants and source spells for cheaper. And it can't be understated how important that is in some decks, because having just one colorless less means that you can cast one, maybe two more spells off of it. Yeah, the difference between casting one spell in a turn and two spells in a turn can add up very quickly over time. Yeah, and if you're especially if you're playing in the control mirror, like being able to answer their counter spell with your counter spell or just be able to get past their counter spell with two spells. Yeah. It's insanely important. Um blue also just cares about where their spells are, whether it's in the library or the graveyard. Uh and so we've got cards like Snapcaster Mage and Torrential Gear Hulk, which allow you to cast instant sorcery spells from your graveyard. And again, like there's a reason why Snapcaster Mage is eighty dollar card. Yeah. Because that effect is so important and so strong, especially with Flash. And the new one, it's Mission Briefing. That It's pseudo Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, Snapcaster on a sorcery. Yeah, it's just what Blue wants to do 
with graveyard recursion is so much more powerful than green wants to do. It's just faster. Yeah, it's faster and it's, it's, it's just, more like spell heavy. Yeah. Whereas green is more like creature and permanent heavy. Yeah. Another way that blue sort of exemplifies knowledge, uh, power through knowledge, is through its tutor packages, kind of teaching others and or teaching yourself or teaching yourself. We got uh, we got cards like long term plans, intuition, archmage, ascension, and parallel thoughts. Yeah, so these are just kind of like general tutors that are, again, tutors are going to be insanely powerful. You'll see that in our black episode. We kind of talk about that. It um, enables you to have whatever answer you need as a second copy, basically. Yeah, and the color where you want answers to everything all the time because you're so reactive, having all these tutors that just get you what you need either a couple turns from now, which you can manipulate, or just right now are so good. Yeah, and there's also just instant sorcery-based ones like Merchant Scroll, Mystical Tutor, Personal Tutor, Spell Seeker, which is a new one from Battle Bond. Uh, these are, again, insanely powerful because if they're at instant speed and you can get an instant speed spell that is the answer that you need, like two mana extra for the answer you need is is a small cost to pay. Uh, along with instants and sorceries getting tutored, the, there's also the best artifact tutors are in blue. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Blue loves artifacts. Blue is probably the heaviest artifact color. Yeah. Uh, I think white is probably a close second in that they have like their equipment package and stuff. But blue loves technology. It loves historical knowledge. Uh, sometimes they want the latest and greatest tech. Other, other times they want just to discover what the old relics are and how to figure out and use them. Um, but Blue loves artifacts and inventions. Just look at the original badass, right? We've got Urza, right? And Urza getting that reprint in Modern Horizons. OP. I was going to say, this is the newest <laughs> of the original badass. <laughs> yeah, like the fact that they're printing Urza in a normal set for the first time is insane. And he's exactly, I think, what everyone would expect. Thinks yeah. That he would be like, I mean, he makes Moxon. Yeah, he, he cares about Artifacts, he makes artifacts, and then he uses them. Uses them, yeah. Yeah, I, it's insane. If you, if you had to think of one character from the lore of magic that embodies blue, it's Urza. I mean, the dude was obsessed with knowledge and creation. Yep. Welcome to blue. So his mantra sort of is, the more you learn, the more you improve. Yeah, and so we see that in cards, like Ethereum Sculptor, and then just, you get better at creating these artifacts, right? So we've got mechanized production, efficient construction, the ability to just pump out artifacts and to do it in a way that is faster and better than ever before is really just kind of something that blue embodies. Yeah, just making everything cheaper or just making more and more and more of it. Yeah, and and then being able to use those things because in a lot of other colors you see artifacts as sort of this old magic that you come across that has an effect, whereas blue sees it as old magic that I can now exploit for my knowledge and you can learn further from my, it, you yeah, know, and, and learn from like, it. You benefit so much from learning and improving upon these old tools, right? And so we see that in uh, Archivian Restore, Power Artifact is something that everybody, I think, should know about if they don't already. It's going to be a costly card, but the broken shit that you can do with that card is, I mean, it's next level. It's where a lot of infinite combos are born. Yeah, there's a reason it's $100. So another thing that Blue does really well, um, specifically for artifacts, is the ability to go find those artifacts. And so it's kind of like, you know, Blue's the archaeologists of the colors. Um, but there's a, like we said before, there's a whole suite of artifact tutors in the color Blue, um, you know, including cards like War of Invention, Fabricate, and Tinker. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more in Ramp, too. Um but we have this idea of where we talk about artifacts as tools, creatures. Are they both? Can they be both? Yeah, blue, is, blue has this kind of unique ability to turn artifacts into battle bots. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, <laughs> uh, it just has this innate, I guess, prowess to say, okay, this is cool. But what happens if I turn it into a creature that can kill things? But we've got cards like Healy's Artistry and Soul Artifact, which I just love the art on. You know, gotta love them scissors. <laughs> See, Healy's Artistry is like a perfect card for that of using like the idea of ancient, you know, artifacts and technology to create whatever you want. The card reads, choose one or both, create a token that's a copy of target artifact or create a token that's a copy of target creature, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types so it's like making like you said like yeah you take something that is old and powerful and 
you copy it and you make a new one, you learn how that's done. Or you find uh, a creature and you're able to create technology that like yeah, mimics yeah, it. Improve you know? on it. Yeah. Cool shit. Blue is a good color. Blue is arguably one of the most powerful colors. And for a long time, it was considered just the most powerful cards. Top five, at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we see cards like Omniscience, you know, that the name itself, I think, speaks for itself. Also, it's just really good. If yeah, it exemplifies it. sort of our last tenant of blue, which is that knowledge is power. So the search for knowledge is sort of the purpose of blue, and the reason is because knowledge is power. So they win the game. They they pursue their means through the knowledge of the game, through the knowledge of the mechanics, through knowledge as a general you know sense of the word throughout the lore. Right, and so that kind of enables blue the power to govern, or at least they feel it enables them. This, it's a similar concept that they share with white in the, in the governing sense. And that's why Azorius is the control colors scheme. But it's just this idea that blue has these laws and rules and regulations to improve everybody. But they think that instead of laying down government rules, they are going to come up with these ideas that everybody needs to follow since I've spent my whole life studying all this stuff i know what's best i yeah. have the most knowledge it's kind of this like idealism yeah. in there where it's just this is this would make the perfect society if everybody followed these rules yeah. i think a good analogy is that white has laws and they follow the laws whereas blue is sort of striving to find the perfect laws they want to make new laws that are better um and they think when they you know gain that knowledge that everybody else should follow suit right and those who know better those with the knowledge are best to judge others uh, and we see that in Alhamarit High Arbiter. Um, and there's the other Arbiter Sphinx that kind of show this idea that if you know the most and you're kind of this governing body, then that you should be able to arbitrate what happens in civil disputes. However, sometimes the laws are a bit misguided that Blue creates and... Sort of leads to like authoritarian... Yeah, it it's more... They're in their favor than it is to help everyone else, right? Trying to make it so that other people can't harm them or to make it so that they can do things faster, better, whatever. Um, and we especially see this in like stopping people from attacking you. Cars like propaganda, war tax, uh, law one cephalid, cephalid empress. Ooh, law That's one a, cephalid. Yeah, the cephalids, yeah. if anyone remembers those back in the day, gross, a little <laughs> oppressive, heavy on the mill, but overall. Not a good tribe. So blue sort of feels like it has the power to bend the rules. Um, and in general, it's bending it in, 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 in its own favor. You know what I mean? Trying to make the best situation for itself because the blue player or the blue color as a whole thinks it knows best. Yeah. And some of this you'll see as game mechanics, right? There's this kind of like cleverness to blue. Um, it has these like tap and untap shenanigans. And... Which is technically against the rules. Yeah, normally you're allowed one untap, and <laughs> yeah. that's at the beginning of your, your untap phase, right? Um, but cards like Pastor might allow you to get beyond that and give you bonus activations and taps. Gary brought it up earlier about God Eternal Kefnet and how just powerful that card is. Just the manipulation and the rule bending that it can kind of do. Yeah, it allows you to cast a spell almost for free. Yeah. Like, the fact that it gets rid of mana cost on it, and it also allows you to do that just from drawing the card, right? Normally you have to draw it, you cast it, and it allows you to cast a copy, meaning that you keep the original. So it allows you to cast that spell a second time, which, again, like, blue, as, as we're going to talk about here, has this very interesting kind of rinse and repeat idea that I have, uh, which is just clone and copy. Yeah, like, so looking at this god here, I, it must have been a different card that I was playing with at pre-release that he was able to scry with, but he was scrying to each turn. And I think that's why it was brutal. Because he, Anytime I would kill his Kefnet, he'd scry to him, put it to the top. I think that's what was happening. And I was yeah. like, fuck that card. Yeah. Uh, but either way, yeah, it's blue being able to control what you draw, being able to control what happens, how things are costed. Um, and yeah, like you said, with the clone and copying, they're able to like create this technology that mimics everything else in the best way. And it's not always technology. Sometimes it's just kind of ethereal apparitions. It's magic shit. 
It's basically the idea of like, if you see something you like and you have the knowledge to be able to create that or the power to be able to create that, uh, you just do it yourself. So we've got uh, spells like Cackling Counterpart, Followed Footsteps, Body Double, Quasi Duplicate, Sakashima the Imposter, and Spark Double. And of course there's the OG clone. And then there's also a lot of cards that make you get you lots of copy of clones. Like the Rite of Replication or Clone Legion. Blue also allows you to clone more than just creatures, right? You got Clever Impersonator, Copy Enchantment. Um, there's Again, we've talked about the ability to copy artifacts. And it even extends to spells, right? Blue kind of has this idea sometimes. Nice spell. I'll take it. You've got Twin Cast, Echo Mage, Narset's Reversal recently. Like There's a lot of ways to kind of foil your opponent's plans by doing whatever they're doing and sometimes cheaper, right? So we've got like Mind Control, Mass Manipulation, Sower of Temptation, Love that card. Uh, you can just take permanence as well. We've got Blatant Thievery, Memnarch. Gore, you love Memnarch? I do love Memnarch. And, of course, there's big cards like Expropriate, which lets you take permanence and also extra turns, but we'll get to extra turns later. So we talked about Mill a little bit earlier, but within this pursuit of knowledge is power, um, knowing that knowledge is power blue does what it whatever it can to limit your opponent's quote unquote knowledge or, or just drain their psyche right or or limit its control over its own mind so to speak when you're talking about the mill strategy so you've got cards like curse of the bloody tome fraying sanity and psychic corrosion that are just basically taking away that person's or that player's options just slowly whittling them yeah, down it's just an attrition it's out just of their slow library. and consistent you don't get to play those spells or those spells. Yeah. Also, that land is now garbage. Now, as the predominant black player uh, among the three of us, I really, really like black. I love... I mean, all of us like black. I mean, black who doesn't so like black, right? Um, <laughs> Let's go I, black, I do, you never go back. I do respect the way that blue does zombies. So, you know, black is just magic necromancy. Um, but the way the lore ties in with blue, their zombies are more like we were saying before we started the, the episode kind of Frankenstein, right? It's all yeah, about it's an, science it's and like, rebuilding. Yeah, yeah. It's an alchemical approach to create life, not simply animate the dead, yeah. right? You get bits and pieces, you put them together and then boom, hit them with that rooftop storm. You're using technology to put all this stuff together. And Stitcher Giraffe is for like the perfect example of what we're oh, talking yeah, about. is in there. That's a... Jesus, brother. We'll talk about her next episode. I brought it up earlier, but the last thing that blue... It's the strongest thing you can do in magic. Yeah. It's broken. It's dumb. They keep printing cards. <laughs> it's upsetting because I f hate fucking Nexus of Fate and I've been playing against it for so long. Just getting into it. And obviously he has some feelings about it, but we're talking about extra turn spells. It's like when I do it, it's fine, but fuck you for doing it. Yeah, it's yeah. like the ability to manipulate mind and manipulate... Uh, an anatomy weren't quite enough, so now Blue's got to be able to extend their knowledge into time and space <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and manipulate the turns themselves. Temporal manipulation, as it were. Yeah, and so we're talking about cards like Time Walk, Temporal Manipulation, Expropriate, and Drew's talking about Nexus of Fate, how it's so good. If you can take extra turns, like you think about what you can do on your own turn. But what if your opponent doesn't get a turn and you just get to act again? But what if you can do that again? Like the way that you are able to chain these abilities and the fact that the original printing time walk was just such a beater. Like it's such a good card that you double your resources, double your uh, ability to act. It's just incredibly strong. Yeah. You're literally moving at twice the pace. The other, your opponents yeah. are. Like, well, even if you just think in like terms of just like your individual faces, double the draw, yeah. double the untap. If you have untap or and end tap mechanics, double attacks, like, without them being able to do virtually anything, assuming they don't have instants. But even then, they burn instant. Guess what I have next turn? Yep, on my next turn, you all you blow all your answers on my last turn. <laughs> well, and just the fact that they don't get a chance to untap between those turns can be enough to burn them between the two. So all of this kind of ties into what Blue is known for, right? They're you OCD of, as fuck. <laughs> well, I was going to say that Blue is just most known for its control. Yeah. Right. It, it is think, the control code. You think of blue and, you know, whether it's tied with black or white or green in some cases, like blue is the control color. It is the color that is going to be 
most heavily influenced and control decks, right? Blue, th- the blue wants to be in control of the situation at all times, period, right? Always wants to set the tempo of the game. It wants to dictate like all the rules. It wants to change how the game is played, basically. It wants to control yeah, the game. What's allowed, when it's allowed. Yeah. Sometimes just say no. <laughs> So now that we've got through some of the overarching themes of what blue likes to do, let's talk about some of the main mechanics that you're going to find with the creatures and the spells within that color. The needy greedy. Yeah. So let's talk about creatures in combat. Corey, you got a list. Okay. So there's obviously a lot of tribes and you can group them down, but some of the most notable ones in blue are that your, mo- your merfolk, your sphinxes, your fairies, homunculi, Sea creatures, your shapeshifters, your blue zombies, your illusions, and of course, wizards. And of, of course, course, we've got it's kind of the newer tribes. We've got like Artificer and stuff like that in there. Yeah. But those are like blue's main tribe. Yeah. Like, Homunculi is kind of like a, an offshoot. Yeah. A lot, a lot of these tribes drift into other colors, but. I was going to say it's easy to say humans, blue. but humans goes kind of for every, every color. color. Yeah. Yeah. Um, blue also has very specific mechanics. Yeah, blue, like we said before, focuses very heavily l- on evasion and less on s- straight up just combat tricks. So you're going to see a blue lot. Blue doesn't want to just punch you in the face. It wants to go around you and like, <laughs> yeah. like cut you a few times. Yeah, you're going to find, especially in their creature types, that there's a lot of flying just in the types of creatures that they have. Um, flying type, is also flying just... Type? Well, no, I mean, their types of creatures have flying. They have lots of birds and fairies and sphinxes. Flying um, wizards. (laughs) And and wizards who can use their magic to fly. So flying is a very uh, recurring theme in a lot of blue cards. We've also got flash, which is kind of an interesting one where we talk about tempo and control. Give your creatures instant speed. Yep. Okay. It's controlling not only the tempo, but also the knowledge. Because if someone attacks into an empty board, you knew more than they did. I actually did have something to block with. You just didn't know, right? You can cast that at any time. Punish them for it. Yep. We've also got Hexproof and Shroud. Um, Like we said before, Unblockable is kind of on the wayside now. They don't really print that anymore. They kind of word it differently. But Hexproof and Shroud are sort of, instead of me dealing with your threats, it's making it nearly impossible for you to deal with mine. We also see mechanics like Skulk. Uh, it's kind of a, a rare mechanic on the on the wayside, yeah. but it's a fairly strong mechanic that allows you to get your smaller creatures in for damage. Blue also likes their clever clever nonsense, instant speed especially, right? We've got tap and untap abilities. We've got bounce, flicker, blink, all of these things. And just to stop you from doing anything, you've got these tax effects like propaganda. And because Blue is just so obsessed with knowing what's going to happen next, lots and lots of scry. Yeah, scry is such a powerful mechanic. It Strike doesn't three seem is like draw card. I was yeah. going to say, it doesn't seem like it, but after you do it a few times, it becomes extremely important. Yeah, anytime you throw a land to the bottom and then draw an answer, it just like immediately validates whatever you've done in the exactly. rest of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Worth the mana. Speaking of mana, we've got mana ramp and mana fixing. And the way that blue does it is not exactly the same way as some of the other colors. Green, obviously, is just really good at grabbing land. Um, but blue sort of has to do some roundabout things. First and foremost, we know that there's a lot of colorless ramp through artifacts, and blue is very good at tutoring for artifacts. So one of the ways that blue can ramp is through its affinity for artifacts. Ooh. Not truly affinity. <laughs> affinity also broken. Also broken. <laughs> Put that on. More um, Shedron doesn't like, but likes to play. Yeah. But we've got cards like High Tide. We're very good in blue at getting infinite mana. So being able to generate more mana than you spend. Like blue cares very much about having islands and whether that be because of the creatures or because of island walk, because island walk still keeps popping up for whatever reason, or just for the ability to ramp. Like you said, high tide doubles your island production and it all of a sudden, like you go from eight into 16. I mean, minus the cost of high tide itself, but you're still getting a big bang for your buck. It's not, it's a one-time blow off versus like ramping for a forest or something. I was going to say it's more thematic because it's like magically creating mana instead of actually going and getting more land for you to utilize right. turns later. For sure. Another thing that blue is really, really good at is creating infinite mana. And 
like Gary was saying, it's using these artifacts. And I was really saying the untapped tap shenanigans. And so using cards like Power Artifact and Basalt Monolith Combo, or I think, is it Grim Monolith? One of the, mo- one of the monoliths. And then just tapping and untapping just over and over, creating infinite mana. Or Ice Crown Scepter, Dramatic Reversal, and any artifact that has for three. Yeah. Like there's a Basically lot of ways that blue is enabling infinite mana combos through artifacts. Yeah, they're basically just able to, like we said before, bend the rules in a way that nets you net positive mana. And being able to bend those rules means you can do it over and over again. Yeah. So, obviously, blue is insane at card draw. We're not going to belittle your intelligence to say that, oh, these are the best cards. Like, (laughs) blue is good at card draw. All the cards. It is what it does best. Yeah. Yeah. However, blue has a lot of interesting ways to go about removing threats. Yeah, you're not going to see a whole lot of just standard murder cards. In blue, you're going to see things like counter spells, which <laughs> effectively is the same. Uh, you just require a little more knowledge and skill to be able to use it. Yeah, there's basically played at a different time. Yep. You've also got bounce effects, which we talked about earlier. Instead of just removing a creature from the game or tossing it to the bin, you're just pacing them. You're making them recast that creature. You're putting it back to their hands, sending them back a turn. Um, and sometimes that's all you need. The rare but powerful creature destruction in blue is kind of the notable one here. Uh, we've got Pondify and Rapid Hybridization. Blue generally doesn't destroy creatures. That's not the way that blue does things. Um, but sometimes it might change those into different creatures. Another way that blue does really well to deal with their threats is through their board wipes. And the way in which blue operates their board wipes is, again, the mass bounce. Um, that's where we get Cyclonic Rift and things like that. Yeah. We touched on it a little bit earlier, but Blue's tutors are almost always for instants and sorceries or artifacts, and they've got the best ones to find those specific cards, if not just any card. Yeah, Blue also just has this kind of sub-theme that we've we've mentioned. Uh, token generation via clones and just the mass tokens. Um, but other than that, Blue's kind of rare to have just tokens in general. Yeah, they're usually... Bird tokens or wizard tokens. Yeah, they're, they're going to be paired with another color generally for yeah. using tokens. So we've got a few planeswalkers here in our that which encapsulates it all section. Of course, you've got to mention Jace. Yeah, we've got JTMS, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Uh, one of the most, if not the most powerful planeswalker printed. Like, and there's nothing like it having them do their plus one and then just like leaving it on top. Like, that's kind of demoralizing, to be honest. <laughs> like, your card, eh, it's not good enough yep, to really deal this with. This is not what you need right now. I will leave it. Yeah. Or I have a counter spell to deal with it. You know, like, um, we've got Tezzeret the Seeker, right? Artifact Man, here to stay. Uh, Cameo the Moon Sage is another good one. And last but not least, we have Cryptic Command and Mystic Confluence. These are incredibly flexible spells that can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Yeah, they encapsulate, like we said, they encapsulate all that Blue wants to do. Draw cards, counter spells, bounce things. So those those two spells, they encapsulate, like we said, everything that Blue wants to do. They want to counter spells, they want to draw cards, they want to bounce things. And just that whole theme of Blue trying to control all of magic. And also just giving you the options to do yeah. what you need at the right time. Yeah, always options at your own pace. Yeah, I think this is a really good overview that we've a pretty quick overview, but a really deep overview of blue that we've gotten here. Um, I think, especially through this whole color wheel series, I think it'll be fun for all of you viewers to go back through your cards and just look at names and look at flavor text. Flavor text, oh, yeah, honestly, flavor text is always surprising to me. Just yeah. whoever does the writing, and yeah. I've, I've seen some of the people who, who do the writing, but like the thought that goes into them, both in the set that they're created and then just the overarching themes of the colors that they're in yeah. is honestly just mad impressive. Watsi yeah. has an entire team of people who just make sure that continuity is there between character arcs and creatures and color types. and um, Which kind of brings us back to my favorite story of magic, right? You go Delver of Secrets yeah. into Final Iteration. Yeah. And it, like to have the foresight and the knowledge to say, okay, we have this creature it transforms into this. Okay, let's take that creature that's transformed and make a new version of it that also transforms. Okay, new version of that, 
I'll transform to make this final perfect form. Yeah. And to spread that out over multiple sets. It's and so incredible how years. well written it is. Just have the themes this weave in between all of these cards in all the colors. Yeah. I mean, they got a good staff over there. They figured it out. As we come to a close here, uh, don't drink a drive. Don't drink underage. We want to make sure you guys are all safe. And, uh, you know, have fun playing Magic. I mean, we're glad you guys came to visit us. You can check us out on Twitter at UUD Podcast. We're on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Send us messages. Uh, next week, we're going to be coming at you with the black episode of The Color Wheel. Um, but until then, have fun, but not too much. Bye.